I'm Pastor TJ. If we've not met, I'd love to meet you after the uh, service and just find out how you made your way here. Our text for this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. It's on page 976 and a Bible and a chair back near you if you want to turn there. Uh, but before I get there, I'll begin reading with verse 11. Before I do so, I want to just um, celebrate a couple of things that happened this, this past week. Uh, the first one is the birth of John Canongate Waterman, our own Jessica Waterman's yeah. and Doug's son. Yeah. Which is just wonderful. Um, we, they're calling him Cannon, which is just like the, I wish my name was Cannon. It's a, <laughs> such a cool name. Um, so Jessica's doing great. Um, she and Doug are just so excited. Uh, so praise God. We've been praying for that little boy for a long time. The other thing is this. Um, Vince Greenwald, our director of students here at Emmanuel Nashville, passed his ordination exam yesterday with the elders. Um, and that was just a wonderful time. Vince is going to be um, preaching in, in view of a call as an assistant pastor um, two weeks from now. And you'll have an opportunity then, then to um, ask him questions, uh, etc. And uh, one of the way, one of the reasons this really, really matters, and the reason that it's cause for celebration is that Jesus. One of the ways he says that I love you and I'm with you is by giving us shepherds after his own heart. And you don't have to be around Vince for more than ten minutes to know that he has the heart of Christ, imperfectly but truly. So this is a really wonderful development. And um, if all goes according to plan, we'll ordain Vince on March the 5th and install him as an assistant pastor. So a couple of things put on your calendar. Now, Ephesians chapter two, you will not be surprised to find out if you've been here the last few weeks, beginning with verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, 
your living word makes us alive. Revive our hearts now. Give us a deep and abiding sense of our insiderness because of what Christ Jesus our Lord has accomplished for us. And bless the preacher as he preaches and the ears as they hear. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Imposter syndrome is the psychological condition of feeling unworthy of our successes, whatever they might be. Um, the academic, for instance, might feel as though she doesn't belong in the circle of academia to which her degrees entitle her. Or a manager might feel as if the authority they've been given is not duly deserved. Or an athlete might feel as if their success is not owing to skill but to luck. Or a parent might feel as if they're never prepared enough or they just don't fit the mold of what a parent ought to be. And this imposter syndrome often leads, as you know, to anxiety, to restless striving, and eventually to despair. But that's not just true of our professional lives or our parenting lives, it's also true of our spiritual lives. There's perhaps nowhere we're more prone to be, you know, feeling like frauds and imposters than when it comes to our relationship with God. And one of the things that we learn from the Bible is that this has been happening since the first century and even before. For instance, when we read the letters of Paul against the background of the Jew-Gentile divide as we've been doing here over the last few weeks, then it becomes obvious to us that one of God's main objectives through the ministry of the Apostle Paul is to overcome Gentile imposter syndrome. That's why Paul's constantly pointing the Gentiles to the accomplishments of Jesus Christ alone for their salvation because the cure for imposter syndrome is resting in the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. The cure and the only cure is resting in the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit. And the same, of course, is true for us today. For most of us, though, the Jew-Gentile thing is not such a big deal anymore. Uh, We might even, you know, read a passage like the one we just read, and we might think to ourselves, um, I just, I I don't really connect with that. But we have other barriers. For instance, chronology. Are we not all at least a little bit tempted to feel less like insiders with God when we read the Bible because we're 2,000 years removed from the historical events of the gospel. I mean, come on. And maybe we we also feel kind of like imposters because we didn't grow up in a house where the Bible was sort of, you know, common. We come to read the Bible and we don't have all of the backstory. The Bible doesn't feel like a native language to us. We feel far off. No matter what our imposter syndrome is feeding off, the answer is always receiving and resting in the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is all about the accomplishments of God for us through Jesus Christ. For instance, the gospel says to us, Christ was born into your reality. In other words, he came into the human race, but not like you and I did. He came in as the son of God, not the son of Adam. Therefore, he's born into our reality, but not under the curse of sin. And then he offers up to God a life that is pleasing to God in every way. He always does what the Father wants. He's happy in his heavenly Father. Every step he takes is a step of obedience. 
And then the gospel tells us that he puts on our sins. The life of obedience we didn't live and all of the disobedience we ought not to have done. He puts on our sins like a robe and he goes to the cross and he offers up himself as a substitute in our place for the wrath of God. Now that's a historical fact. The gospel is both history and revelation. People were there, there were eyewitnesses. He offered himself up to God. We know that by history. And what we know by revelation is that when he did, the Father said, I accept. I accept. Your perfect life in place of all of theirs so that I am completely satisfied that justice has been served at the cross. And I would deal with them as I'm pleased with you. And just to sort of wrap the thing up and just to show us how accepted we actually are, God raises his son from the dead. As if to say, all of the, you know, death is the penalty of sin, all of the sin for which the penalty of death was being imposed has been eradicated, it's been satisfied, it's been settled in the death of Christ. Therefore, it's only fitting that he should be resurrected. Therefore, when you see his resurrection, you're looking at your future. Now, that's the gospel. And that gospel is the only thing, the only accomplishment that can make us feel like insiders with God and get us past this wretched imposter syndrome. So that's what I want to talk to you about today from Ephesians 2, 17 to 18 how Jesus legitimates us together as insiders through his gospel. What if it were actually possible to feel as legitimate a Christian as the Apostle Paul? Well, what this text shows us is that we don't really have permission to think of ourselves as anything other. So two weeks ago, we considered the posture of peace. Last week, the prince of peace. And today, the preacher of peace and the privilege of peace. Look with me at verse 17. And he came, that is, Jesus came, and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. He's the preacher of peace. Uh, Paul began this letter by reminding these Gentiles of where they came from, calling them to remember that they were once far off, and Jesus came for them, but they don't need Jesus any less than those who were near. I hasten to add that. Um, they were without God in the world. The uh, literal translation of that, of that phrase in the Apostle Paul would be that they were atheists, not because they didn't worship gods, but because they didn't worship the true God. They were without the God of Israel, therefore they were far off. And perhaps you know something of what that feels like to be sort of outside of, uh, of a, an ongoing reality and that you parachute into. I experienced that when I moved cities at the start of my freshman year in high school. And anybody who wants to relive high school just didn't get an accurate dose of high school. Um, I moved cities, started my freshman year, and I remember, you know, sort of parachuting into something that was ongoing. It had its own history that didn't include me. It had its own insider language, um, its own inside jokes, its own friend groups. And I would have remained an outsider if it hadn't been for um, my cousin who lived in this city uh, named Charlie. And he grew up in that city. He was a grade ahead of me. And he was the first one to sort of pull me into the established narrative. And he owned me as family member. (laughs) And he welcomed me as a friend. And as a result, I had instant credibility as an insider. And when it comes to being an insider with God, there's only one Charlie 
to pull us in, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, he came and preached peace to you who were far off. Question, when did Jesus preach in Ephesus? He didn't. He preached almost entirely to Jews, not to Gentiles. When did they hear Jesus preach? When they heard Paul declare to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because everywhere the gospel of God is truly preached, the spirit of Christ is preaching so that there's no such thing as a second generation Christian, really. We all hear the gospel from the mouth of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit so that all of us can say, I'm here today. I'm believing in Jesus Christ today because Jesus wants me here. He has invited me in. He's happy I'm here. Which means that my preaching does not empower the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus empowers the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is essentially God opening up his heart to us. It shows us how he feels about evil and injustice. It shows us how he is patient and kind and merciful to those who just go on sinning against him. It shows us how he's gracious. And no matter how bad I might be at preaching it, the one thing I can't say to you is there's no power in the gospel I preach because it's the gospel of God. And wherever it's preached truly, Jesus accompanies it with his power. And in this day of tremendous loss of integrity in the pulpit, I think it's even more important that we grab onto this. Some of us were led to Christ by people who no longer believe in Christ or who even discredited themselves completely as Christians. When somebody does that, in the end, all they do is remove the middleman between you and Jesus so that now you can see it was Jesus all along who was preaching to me. Jesus is ever the preacher of peace with God. That's number one. The second thing is this the privilege of peace, for through him, that is through Jesus Christ, the preacher of peace, through him, we together both have access in one spirit to the Father. Through Jesus our Lord, all of us together, Jews, Gentiles, black, brown, white, pre-modern, modern, modern, post-modern, we all have been given access in one spirit to the Father. There's not a separate Jewish door, a separate American door, there's just... Jesus, and he's enough, and the power of the Holy Spirit uniting us together to the Father. He's, Jesus is our doorway into reality with God, and the Holy Spirit is the connectivity of reality with God. Or to put it another way, Jesus preaches peace to us. The Holy Spirit unites us, and the Father receives us as children of God. We now enjoy all the rights and privileges of a firstborn son. And the privilege that's being emphasized here, of course, you see it in this one word, access. We both have access in one spirit. What's the point in saying we both? Does not we include both? The point is to exult and enthuse in the accomplishment of the cross. Jesus was so successful. Jesus is so successful. You don't know anybody more successful than Jesus. Jesus is so successful in the work that he does that he takes people who are just way far off and people who are way near and he pulls them together into one united family creating one new human race and binds them together in his love. He's so loving that he can be the love between us, right? He's, as Spurgeon used often to say, he's the darling of heaven. He's love covered over in flesh. 
and you cannot outmaneuver him. You cannot find your way into him without finding your way into relationships with all kinds of other people that he wants to save. And you just have to like it because you love him so much. I mean, sometimes I see people in church, I'm not going to name any names, who I think, you know, you're not creating the best experience for me right now. (laughs) But when I see those people, it's, you know, and they love Jesus. I just, I say, you know, okay, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing. But that person is living proof that you're the Savior and I'm not. And you've got some purpose of grace for this. And I've now been a Christian long enough to love people who I've felt that way about, and they actually become the people that I love the most. So that the very things about them before that were most annoying to me, now it's like, you know, ah, so and so. I just love them. You know, they're still crazy. I just love them. The access that we share to God is of a familial nature, and that's why Paul leaves this phrase ringing in our ears, in one spirit, to the Father. It's the first time he's used the phrase the Father since he got to chapter two here. And it's significant. There are 99 names for God in Islam. Not one of them is Father. Because only the Son of God can grant us access to God as father. It's the difference between accessing Buckingham Palace as a tourist and accessing it as the son of a king. Or as Tim Keller puts it somewhere, only a child can wake up a king in the middle of the night for a glass of water. That's the kind of access you have. That's how near you've been brought to God through him. I was talking with our own Tony Shepard, our director of assimilation here at Emmanuel, and he pointed out to me um, something about this reality I I hadn't noticed. He said, you know, I have access to just as much of Alabama as you do. I'm from Alabama. But then he recounted to me an experience at a gas station in Alabama in which it was made clear to him that though he had access to that gas station, because of the color of his skin, he was not accepted at that gas station. And that's the photo negative of the kind of access that we have in the gospel. It's not merely that God tolerates us. We have access with welcome. He's happy about it. And if we're really honest, isn't that one of the things that that trips us up? I mean, sure, I'm a Christian, but we create a category that's not in the Bible. It's certainly not in the heart of God. Second class. I'm a Christian second class. And then a verse like this comes along and just obliterates it. Second class. Did Jesus fail so badly? as to create a second class of Christians? Or was he completely successful? You see how this hymns us in? Either we're children of the Father or we're not. Now you might be thinking, well, you know, the Lord, our our Heavenly Father has really been disciplining me lately. Okay. Do you know why I discipline my kids? Because I love them. And nothing so draws out my discipline as when they put themselves in harm's way. You parents know exactly what I'm talking about. But where else would you rather be? Even the discipline of God is saying to you, I love you. I want what's best for you. You're so in with me. You're so, your status with me in my son is so not at risk that I can discipline you for your good. God wants us all to feel like the insiders that we are in Christ Jesus. Because that's the very thing that Jesus died to accomplish. Therefore, we can be totally free from this wretched imposter syndrome. And until we are totally free from this wretched imposter syndrome, we're not actually ready to do anything for Jesus yet. Somebody uh, pointed out to me recently that I haven't actually asked anyone to do anything since we've been preaching in Ephesians, not really. I mean, I've had a few points of application, but 
The reason I haven't is because there are 41 commands in the book of Ephesians, and only one of them is in the first half, and that's the command to remember. Just remember the gospel. Because until you are just deeply resting in and receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ, in other words, in, until, until what Jesus has done for you is completely satisfying to you, then you're not ready to do anything for him because you'll always be doing it to earn your way in. But when you just, just collapse onto his gospel, let it hold you. Receive, rest, and then come back again. Receive the gospel and rest. And then come back again the next week and receive the gospel and rest. And you keep doing that until that's what is energizing you. Then you're ready to do something. And, and until, until you're there, you're, you're not actually ready to do anything. And I would invite you not to do anything. I mean, I'm tempted to say, go ahead and serve with the kids. But even then, no. I, receive. Now, some of us have a lot of getting over our Christianity to do. Because for years, we've basically been energized um, by a kind of pull your own weight kind of Christianity. And we haven't put our full weight down in the gospel. We don't feel completely satisfied that we could do nothing the rest of our lives and be totally accomplished in the eyes of God because of Jesus Christ. So we just need to sit. As one old Lutheran pastor put it, for once in your life, stop and receive. Through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We're totally in. He feels great about it. And we can too. So let's prepare our hearts now to receive Holy Communion. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you left nothing to chance, that you have accomplished all that is necessary for our salvation, our security, and our consciences to be satisfied. You did all of this through your Son, and we praise you for the way that you did it so that you can get all of the glory. And we pray, Father, that you would energize us now by the accomplishments of Jesus Christ so that we can know the joy of living for him. So that we can just sail out of church today with the wind of his accomplishments in our sails ready to enjoy living for you. In the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen.